Hey there, it's me Bill back here in the tiny little workshop and this week going to be talking about using some of this old television tube degaussing wire to wind a speaker inductor coil as part of a crossover. I recently acquired some JBL cinema speaker cabinets with no drivers in them and no crossovers. So I have to build everything back from scratch. So this is a prototype of the finished product. I will eventually purchase some nicer inductor coils and capacitors and resistors and things like that. But I'm building the prototype out of junk that I happen to have laying around, like degaussing wire and resistors and capacitors from old televisions. So stick with us and I'll show you how I do this. In the wood stash, I found and trimmed a small cast off from a fruit tree that had been cut down near my office. With it chucked up in the lathe, I started cleaning and smoothing. I used calipers to more accurately measure the diameter once it was getting close to the right size. There wound up being a slight rise in the middle which I figured would make it easier to remove the coiled wire after making all those wraps. These wires are used to degauss the display so they wrap around the glass. 0 0.0254 inches is a 22 gauge wire. Then I cut some pallet wood to fit as end caps. A pilot hole was drilled in the center of each piece so they could be held together in alignment while gluing and clamping this side. The other end cap was made with a hole saw and it wasn't permanently attached so here I'm measuring the gap before tightening down a hose clamp to keep the removable end cap in place. Then I drilled a small hole in one end for the wire to pass through. And away we go. One turn. Two turns. Only 190 more turns to go until it's complete. Now I wound up marking one corner of the permanent end cap so I could more easily keep track of how many turns I was making. Sure, it's not the prettiest thing, but remember this is a testing prototype. The DC resistance was supposed to be 1.81 ohms if you were using copper wire, but this is aluminum wire. Again, prototype. For the first coil, I applied some urethane to try and keep the wires tightly wound together, and I figured it would stick to the form, and I was right. I was able to free this one with lots of very careful razor blade trimming and screwdriver prying. Then I had the brilliant idea of trying to cover the form with wax paper and make another coil. Unfortunately, this was even worse than the first one. The wax paper somehow got stuck to both the coated coil and the wooden jig simultaneously. It was time to give up on the aluminum wire and the urethane. Instead, well, since I don't have an instrument that can measure inductance and I couldn't find information about the inductance difference between copper and aluminum wire very easily, I gave up on the aluminum and switched instead to some true copper wire. The degaussing coil that I had that was true copper was a little thinner gauge, but it still should work. So much electrical tape. Now, like I said, this time I would not be using urethane. With the wire all wound, I used some simple masking tape to hold the coil together until I could free it from the jig, and then I used some small zip ties to hold it tight. This kept the wire nearly as tight as the urethane, but with much less damage to the coil. Now 
Once the ends were trimmed, it was ready to be put in a circuit. Hey, Rob, pick me! Uh, I, I can't. You're too big. Hey, how about me? I'm 47 microfarads. That actually might work. Then I needed to pick out some other components to go along with everything. Some heavily insulated 18 gauge wire was trimmed and stripped. I kept the wire colors consistent for the positive and negative sides, white and black. Now I didn't have one 24 microfarad capacitor in the right voltage range like my schematic was calling for. Here I'm using two identical 47 microfarad capacitors and I'm going to wire them in series. This should approximate one 23 and a half microfarad capacitor. What was that in the back? No, I'm sorry, today's lesson doesn't have anything to do with alternate dimensions. It's an excellent question though. As I was saying, capacitors can be connected in parallel and in series. Let's say that we have two identical capacitors for each of our examples of 20 microfarads capacitance. Connect them in parallel and their capacitance adds together. You get 40 microfarads, but the voltage handling is only as great as the weakest member. In series, however, their capacitance is halved. In our case, we have identical 20 microfarad capacitors. Well, they would only be able to handle 10 microfarads, but their voltage capacity would roughly double. There you have it. I tin the leads for the stranded wire first. Again, this is a prototype for testing purposes. When I finally build the end product, I will pay more attention to the appearance of the solder joints and the heat and all that. With the series capacitors complete, there was one more capacitor that connects with a 10 ohm resistor between the channels after this pair in the circuit. This is the kind of delicate work where having a multi-armed grabber soldering station would come in real handy. And there we have it. Here's the hand-drawn diagram that I was following and the complete circuit. Now I just needed a way to keep everything stationary so it wouldn't be sliding around on the board. Hot glue to the rescue. I may choose a different adhesive for the finished product whenever I get around to making that, but this was quick and easy. Finally, we get to see just how those other two coils looked in comparison to the third and final attempt. Not very pretty. With the crossover complete, it was time for some testing to take place to see if it really works. Did you hear the sweep? I used free Rumi Q software from the internet, a cheap Yamaha mixer I found at the thrift store, and a calibrated Dayton audio microphone. With this inexpensive setup, I can make consistent and accurate measurements of frequency response and other parameters. Now I'm putting the crossover in the circuit. Since I'm not using the official JBL 2225H woofer, I had to wire two 4 ohm 15 inch woofers in series in order to get an 8 ohm load. The exact same load was used for both tests to keep things consistent. Now these are very expensive, heavily insulated, proprietary, audiophile approved wire connectors, by the way. It's time to take a look at the measurements to see if I succeeded or failed. This first measurement shows the frequency response from 100 hertz up to 1500 hertz. The blue line is without the crossover in place, while the pink line shows the response with it in line. It's plain to see that above 800 hertz, the pink line is tracking lower than the blue one. 
I ran another measurement up to 3000 Hz to show that this trend continues as the frequency rises, exactly as planned. It appears that I have actually succeeded. I have turned trash into something useful. This crossover worked like I was hoping it would. I do want to point out, if you're going to be making your own air core inductor coil, you might want to use some PVC pipe. It might be a little easier. You can generally get a piece that's a little bit larger and cut a slot down the side and then squeeze it down to the diameter that you need. I figured out all the calculations that I needed from online calculators. The links for those are going to be in the description down below. You can check those out. Those are other people's websites. And when I do go to build the final crossover, once I've got the genuine JBL 2225H woofers, I do plan to buy all brand new components for this crossover. The inductor coil will be a larger gauge of wire. The capacitors will be brand new and not run in a goofy configuration so that everything matches across and works like it should. But I thought this actually turned out to be a pretty good exercise for when I go to assemble this in the future. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.